Good morning and welcome to this meeting of Columbia Road Baptist Church. I am thrilled that you have chosen to be with us this morning and I've been praying this morning that God would meet with us, that he give us exactly what we need from his word. And for those of you that are joining us online, a special welcome to you also. I know that many of you would love to be here, but circumstances haven't allowed that this morning. We're praying for you and for those that uh, perhaps are joining for the first time online, let us know that you're there. We have something that we'd love to send you in the mail as uh, an encouragement, uh, you can reach out to us at columbiaroad.org slash hello. If you're able to, would you stand with us this morning? We're going to ask the Lord to bless our time together, because that's what's going to make it all worthwhile. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that in this hour, as you promised, as we've gathered together in your name, that you would be here in our midst, that you would help us to not just have church, but to have an encounter with you. May you, by your spirit, guide us into truth as we hear your word preached. I pray that you would give us exactly what we need to hear through it. I pray for the songs that we sing, that we might be mindful of the words, we might mean them with our whole hearts as we worship you. I pray that you'd be glorified in the singing. Father, bless those that are playing and singing, those that are working in the technology to make sure that everything goes smoothly. Junior church, as it happens later on this morning, I pray that you bless richly those that are in the preschool classes. May everything that happens this morning be done in a way that glorifies and honors you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Grace greater than our sin. Praise God that God's grace is greater than our sin. As Will comes to lead us in this one, 241. grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon Spin. 
before. It's not in your hymnals, but it will be up on the screens. Come behold the wondrous mystery. <clears throat> may come forward as we sing just the chorus to It Is No Secret.
Would you pray for the offering? Father, indeed, you've done so much for us. And as we collect these tithes and offerings, we know you multiply them to build your kingdom. Father, just help us to be a cheerful giver as we uh, receive the collection of tithes and offerings. Your love, your mercy, and your grace is beyond all bounds. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
this time, our young friends, that's grades one through six, are dismissed to junior church. And if you have a young person with you that falls into the age of junior church and you would like to accompany them to see all that's going on back there, you are always welcome to join them. We continue in our series that we've been going through the past couple of weeks on prayers. On prayers. Have you ever had no idea what to do, but you just pretended that you did anyway? I don't know if it was at work. I don't know if it was parenting. I don't know if it was in church. I don't know if it was in school. But you've probably had that experience where everybody in the room is looking at you like you know what to do. And so you pretend to know what to do. It's a humbling thing to not know what to do, and life is filled with those moments. You figured that once you, you grow up and you become an adult, because when you're a kid, it seems like adults know everything. How many of you remember having that thought as a kid that adults knew everything? Mom and dad knew everything. Did you, do you remember having that? Do you ever remember the day when you realized they didn't know everything because you finally got away with something? Right? You were 14? 13. 13. <laughs> when you become that age... You start to realize that your parents need wisdom, need discernment as much as you do. And then you have your own children, and you really have no idea what's going on. And so you pretend the best you can. I remember being in college and not knowing how to do many things that I had to learn how to do on my own because I was so well taken care of back at home. And so cooking and cleaning and trying to figure out how to get stuff done was a challenge. I remember one time in particular that a roommate and I, we had finally been given a dorm room with a kitchen. Pretty fancy. We were at Ohio State. And um, I remember that after you cooked bacon, that you would pour the grease out of the pan and into like a container so you could throw it away so it didn't go down your drain. And, and I'm like, okay, that's no problem. So my friend has the pan. And I'm like, here, let's just grab something to put it in. And I grab a red Solo cup. I really thought that would have worked. But of course, the grease was hot, and it melted right through that onto the floor, splattering all over our legs. It was a great moment. We just looked at each other after it happened like, we are idiots. <laughs> we should have seen that coming. But many people make decisions, and important decisions, that have consequences and stakes, but they don't truly think about them. They do whatever everyone else is doing, or they, they choose the path of least resistance as though they're being swept down a river and have no ability to choose. Or they, they muddle through, which is, you know, we come up with the first idea that pops into our head, we run a check through it for any immediate problems, and if there are no immediate problems, we're like, yeah, let's do that. Or we think about our decisions, but we don't really know what makes a decision a good one. Is it the thing that's most convenient for me? Is it what's most comfortable for me? Is it what makes me look the best? And so if you know Christ, if you're one of God's children, we ask this question, how should God's people make decisions? How do we know which way to go? And what's the criteria we should be judging by when we look at our options? So we're going to look at the newly appointed, the newly crowned king of Israel, Solomon, and peek into his dreams as he prays to the Lord. And so if you have your Bible, we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3, beginning in verse number 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. 
Give, therefore, thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord, that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked for riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. Let's pray. Father, I do pray in the name of Jesus that once again you would meet with us. May your spirit help us to understand what we need from your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We have still what we would call the United Kingdom of Israel. This is a thousand years before the Lord Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And at this time, there is no northern kingdom. There is no southern kingdom. There is just the one kingdom of Israel. This is before the split happens. And David was their king for many, many years. And you know the stories of David. David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, the shepherd David, the the giant killer, David, the man after God's own heart, David, the great warrior. We know David. Well, now his son is on the throne, and his son's name is Solomon, and Solomon is a relatively young man, and God comes to Solomon by night and encourages Solomon to pray to him, to ask him for something. In verse number five, in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, And God said, ask what I shall give thee. Now, this has nothing to do with whatever it was Solomon ate before he went to bed. Some of you know that if you eat certain foods before you go to bed, your dreams get weird, right? This is not that. It was not uncommon, especially in the Old Testament, for God to speak to people through dreams. I want you to know that not every dream that you have is from the Lord. Is there a possibility that God could still speak to somebody through a dream? There is nothing in the Bible that says he can't, but here's something I would let you know. We don't need God to speak to us in a dream. We have his word. And because we have his word, and it is completed, and it is without error, and it is perfect for everything we need in life and godliness, we don't need to have any dreams. And should God perhaps speak to us in some way where we think, oh, that maybe it was in a dream, God's spirit will never contradict God's word. God's spirit will never contradict God's word. Lots of people have gotten themselves in all sorts of trouble because they think they had a dream or a message or a vision or a sign, but what that vision or message or sign says goes against what the Lord has said in his word. And we know that there is no division between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as far as what they believe to be true and false and right and wrong and what ought to be done and ought not to be done. But he has this dream, and it truly is the Lord speaking to him. And the Lord encourages Solomon to ask for something, to pray for something. I would love for that to happen. Because I I had this weird idea in my head that I was always bothering God when I prayed. I don't know if you ever had that thought, but God is busy, and my prayers seem kind of small. Most of the time, my prayers almost seem kind of childish and what I'm asking him for, or the problems that I have. Because I, I don't know if you've ever had this idea where you can only pray to God if you're in an airplane that's crashing, or your brakes go out in your car while you're driving, or you're in the hospital room with a bad diagnosis, and, and you think those are really the time to pray. But what we find out from the Lord is that not only did he invite Solomon to pray, he invites you and I to pray and to ask for things. The words of Jesus Christ himself in Matthew chapter 7. 
In verse number seven, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. So when I get this silly idea in my head that I'm sort of, God, I know you're busy, kind of peek in to see if he's on the phone. I know you're busy, but do you have just a minute? Do you have, I have this, this problem and I know it's not important, but I got this, do you have like a little old, like a, 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 a hand-me-down blessing I could have? I don't need a fresh one. I just, if you've got one that's on the shelf, it's a little bit dusty, that's fine. I don't need anything special. And it's because I feel like I'm bothering him, but God has encouraged us to come to him in prayer and to ask. And not in just some religious exercise, but because God has designed the Christian life to work by answering the prayers of his people. People who don't know God, who have never trusted Christ as Savior, they may be able to get by in this world through working harder, through burning the candle at both ends, through scheming and through cutting corners and and doing whatever it takes to get their hands on money. But I promise you, God will not allow his children to to prosper that way. God has designed the Christian life so you and I get the things that we need by praying for them. And we ask, and God promises to respond. If we're seeking direction, he promises that it'll be found. And if we knock because we need a door open, the situation change, he says, it it will be opened. And that's, that's part of it. So you and I have this same encouragement that Solomon had to ask for a blessing. Back in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse number 6, Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he has walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. Solomon begins praising God, begins thanksgiving, starts telling God how appreciative he is of all that he's done for his father. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Not every kingdom has a peaceful transfer of power. Not every king has a son to sit on the throne. There are lots of things that could go wrong. And if you know, in the life of David, there were many things that almost went wrong. In fact, the wrong son almost got onto the throne and kind of decided himself, this son, the wrong one, that he would just kind of declare himself king and see what happened. There was all sorts of trouble, but now God had promised David that his son would sit on the throne if he walked in God's statutes And God kept his word. Verse number seven. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. Isn't that wild that Solomon calls himself thy servant? He calls himself a servant. Even a king, which is the height of all of man's power and authority, is still just a servant before the Lord. And we don't live in an age and a time when when we have kings, per se, that have the power that a king had back in Bible times. But I want you to know that kings were powerful. Have you ever noticed all of the times in Proverbs it tells you to be careful about making the king angry? Because now, if you make a politician angry, there's due process, at least there's supposed to be. There's checks and balances and laws. Do you know what checks and balances there were on the king? In most places, nothing. If he wanted you dead, you died. If he wanted you gone, you were exiled. If he decided that your family was going to come live with him in the castle, so if you ever did something he didn't like, he could take it out on your family. And it happened all the time. But even at the height of that much power, Solomon recognized that he was still underneath God and God's commandments. He says, now I'm the king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child, and I know not how to go out or come in. He's not saying that he's seven years old in this statement. What he's saying is he feels helpless. It seems entirely too big for him. Have you ever had a child try and take a problem on their shoulders that was just too big for them? That they wanted to try and fix that problem? Maybe they even thought it was their fault when it certainly wasn't. But they become quickly overwhelmed because they don't know what to do and they don't have the resources and they don't have the experience and when he says I'm a little child, he says I'm looking at this great task of being king And I feel like I'm powerless. And I don't know which way to go. In fact, he goes so far as to say, I don't know how to go out or come in. The normal things that you do, the day in and day out, is how we might say it. Uh, He says, I don't even know how to do that. And now I'm supposed to be the king. He had a very healthy idea of who he was 
and a very healthy idea of who God was. Some people never get to this place where they realize that on the large things, the important things, the things that have stakes and consequences in their lives, that we really have very little control. Isn't that a scary thought? There's, there's people and things that I love in this world, and I want to keep them safe, and I want to take care of them, and I want to bless them, but it's wild to think about how little I can actually do. Can you keep your spouse healthy? Can you keep your children safe? Can you make sure that they make good decisions? Can you surround them with the right people? Can you make sure that your job will continue, that you'll always have enough money in the bank account, that you'll always know which way to go when a decision? And the answer is no, we don't know those things. And that's, that's startling if you forget God. But if you remember that the Lord is there and his commitment towards us and his power towards us, then instead of it becoming a fearful thing to realize we have no control, it becomes a restful thing because it's not in my hands anymore. It's in the Lord's hands because of how little it is that I can control. He continues in verse number eight, and he says, thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. He's bringing his problems before the Lord, and he says, Lord, uh, I have to be king, not just of anybody, but your people, your chosen people, and there's a lot of them, and I'm going to be called to do a lot of things and make a lot of choices. Verse number nine, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. So what he asks for is an understanding heart, a receptive heart, a heart that will hear and listen. This is the opposite of a hardened heart. Do you, if you think in the book of Exodus, it talks about the hardened heart of Pharaoh, where Pharaoh was completely closed to whatever it is that God was trying to tell him. An understanding heart is the other side of that, where you're receptive. Do, do you remember antennas? for your television or your radio, right? Do you remember having to adjust them in order to get the channels, right? How many of you had to climb onto the roof to adjust the antenna? Anybody actually have to climb onto the roof to do that? All right, a couple of you, right? I, I had, I remember I had little rabbit ear antennas and you'd have to move them all around. I know some of you kids are like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, this is back in the 1900s. And, and so you have to move the antenna. They have to become receptive. They have to be moved to the right spot in order to, to pick up what's being broadcast to them. And Solomon is saying, I don't want a heart where I'm so wise in and of myself that I know everything myself. He says, I want to be thoroughly open to the God of all wisdom. I want my heart to hear what it is that you have to say to me. He wasn't asking for some sort of independent gift. He wanted to be so thoroughly connected to the Lord that he would know which decision. He says it like this. He says that I may discern between good and bad. Discernment. How many of you would say we have a world that's just filled with too much discernment? Anybody feel like the world? But people can take and use wisdom and make good decisions. You just feel that you're swamped in people around you making good decisions? I don't feel that way. I don't even feel that way about my own life. There are many times when I make unwise decisions. And so what do we need? We need discernment to choose between good and bad. You say, well, I can choose between good and bad. I can too when it's obvious. If it's obviously between evil and good, then I know which one to choose. But when it's slight and I'm not sure, when it seems like there's no good choices or when every choice is good, then I have to know how to make an answer and Solomon had an entire nation of people to judge. He says, for who is able to judge? Who is able to govern, to guide this, thy so great a people? He realized the stakes that were there. He wasn't just concerned about himself and looking wise. He's like, listen, I've got a job to do that you've appointed me to do, and your name is tied to this God. And if I mess up, it's going to hurt your name. If the nation of the Lord, the Lord's people... If they fall flat on their face, and if they do the wrong thing, if I lead them wrong, that's going to look bad on you, Lord, and it's going to be bad for your people. And in verse number 10, it says, And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked for this thing. What a simple statement, but what a thing to make God happy, to please him, to make him smile. 
Sometimes we have such a distant view of God, we, we don't even think that we can please him or that he hears or cares at all. But here, Solomon's asked what he brought before the Lord made him happy. Verse 11, And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Notice, notice the wording here, that you have not asked for yourself, thyself, long life. Neither ask riches for thyself, nor the life of thine enemies. In other words, Solomon's prayer really wasn't about himself. When God said, you have a blank check, Solomon, pray. What is it you want? And apparently he could have asked for all of these things, though he chose not to. He didn't pray for what would make his life easiest. Because he could have said something like, hey, defeat all my enemies so I have no problems. Right? He could have prayed that. Or he could have said, give me all the money so that I can spend my way out of every problem. Right? Make me healthy, make me live longer than anybody who's ever lived. He could have prayed all of those things, but he did not ask for himself that, but has asked for understanding to discern judgment. Verse 12, behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. We don't, we don't have the same Bible phrases that we used to, but people used to talk about the wisdom of Solomon, right? As wise as Solomon, because he became, historically speaking, the wisest natural man to ever walk the face of the earth. No one was given more of an understanding or a wise heart than him. And we see that played out in his life. And when he stayed close to the Lord and followed the Lord, he made amazing decisions, and there wasn't a time of peace or prosperity. It was really the golden age of the United Kingdom of Israel when Solomon reigned, and the, the money that was gathered and spent to build God's beautiful temple and the, the king's palace, and how well even the servants, even the slaves, were so finely arrayed and had such nice things that when other dignitaries from other countries would come in, they'd be like, wow, I heard that it was good here, but I haven't been told the half of it. This is amazing. God said that there won't be anyone like him before him or after him in the wisdom that he gives. And I have also given thee, verse 13, that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. He said, you didn't ask for riches, but you're going to get it anyway. And you didn't ask for honor to be the victor over your enemies, but I'm going to give you that honor. And he says in verse number 14, And if thou wilt walk in my ways and keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did, then I will lengthen thy days. He says, you didn't ask for long life, but if, if you will walk in a way that pleases God, if you will walk in the pathway of blessing, I will bless you. And can, can I just say, for those of you that know your Bible, I'm very encouraged by this phrasing here. It says here, as David did walk. As David did walk. That as David walked in God's ways and kept his commandments and kept his statutes. Let me ask you a question. Did, did David always do right? Did David have any major failings at times? Absolutely. You know what God doesn't do? Judge us by our worst day. Isn't that good? Praise God. He doesn't just... Because some people will write you off if you mess up one time. You can have a lifetime of being faithful and kind, and you mess up one time, and I'm done with you. I want nothing to do with you. Praise God we don't have a God who's like that. He understands our frame that we are but dust, and that he says here, speaking to Solomon, that David walked in my ways. Because he was perfect, because he did it every day? No, but that's what characterized his life. That's what characterized his life. Verse 15, And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. Solomon woke up and realized that God had spoken to him and that he immediately goes and starts worshiping the Lord afterwards and pulling together all sorts of sacrifices. So what is it? What is it? that you and I take away from the things that Solomon has prayed in his dream prayer to the Lord. 
The first thing I would say is we need to recognize that we don't have all the answers. Recognize that you don't have all the answers. Solomon was called upon and would be called upon to make many frequent important decisions. And not always with a lot of time to think and to prepare and to meditate on them. Some would be clear cut, but many would take discernment because it wasn't an easy do this good thing or do this bad thing. And we oftentimes think that we have all the answers. And why do we think that we have all the answers? Because we mistakenly believe that we need to have all the answers. We think we need to have all the answers. And so we convince ourselves that we do even when we don't. Either because we told it's weak, we've been told that it's weak to ask for help, we don't believe that anyone would help us, or because our flesh refuses to say, I am not enough for this. I need something more. Sometimes we don't even know that God desires to give us the answers. Have you ever taken a test in the classroom and your teacher's staring at you? And he's just watching what you write down. And you're thinking, this guy wants me to fail. This, this lady's not helping me at all. She could help me, but she's not helping me. Sometimes we think God's like that. He doesn't want to help us. But the Lord is desirous to bless his people. We don't have to knock on his door sheepishly and try and convince him to bless us. He desires to bless us if we walk in the pathway of blessing. If we walk according to his way and his commandments and his statutes, God desires to pour out those blessings on his people. And so it's okay to not know everything because God already knows everything. Secondly, we should make decisions that honor God. We should make decisions that honor God. Solomon, his prayer pleased God because it was a selfless prayer, because it was about the Lord and the Lord's people and doing the things that God had asked Solomon to do. And it wasn't just about Solomon getting rich. It wasn't just about Solomon looking good. It wasn't about him having monuments and statues built of him so that he would have a great legacy. It was about, Lord, these are your people. You've made me king. I don't have what it takes to take care of them, to glorify your name, and to do what you've called me to do. I need help. And so he recognized, what a self-aware moment. I don't even know if I like that term, but people use that today. A self-aware moment where you know enough about yourself to know something about yourself you wish you didn't know. Right? To know that you have failings and you have weaknesses and that there are things that you're not good at and you need the Lord to step in. Right? God has gifted many people in this room with many strengths, but not everybody is strong in every area. And not everybody is always going to know what to do. What do we do then? Well, we have to make a decision. How do we know what's the right decision? Well, as Pastor Steve often says, how can I honor God in this situation? That's really the criteria. You say, do I ask what's the most convenient for me or the most cost-effective? Not always. Do I ask whatever's the easiest, whatever seems to make the sense to me? Because there are people that will tell you what you ought to do all the time. Have you noticed that there's no lack of advice, whether it's from your friends or your family or just scrolling online? I already saw a few things this morning on how I can get absolutely ripped, swole. Everyone's posting their, their exercise routines. It really only takes going to the gym, according to this guy, and he had the fire emoji underneath his, his recipe you know, for fitness. So that's, that's pretty good reason to listen. But I think it was like 200 burpees a day, go to the gym you know, eight times a week. And he had all sorts of things on there. And from the picture that he posted, he may know what he's talking about. But you and I, we can't just guess that they know what they're talking about. We need more than that. We need to know what would please the Lord. How do we honor the Lord? Oftentimes, God functions on conventional wisdom. The Bible says the prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, right? He looks ahead, he takes stock of what's going on, and he removes himself from evil. He doesn't let it happen. God oftentimes functions on wisdom that you and I get. But has the Lord ever led you in a way that at the time it really didn't make a whole lot of sense? Conventional wisdom would have told you go this way, not this way, but you were positive that God was leading you this way. And now that you've made that decision, you're thrilled that you listened to what it was the Lord said? Or now that you've made the decision, you're kicking yourself that you didn't do what it is that he said? Have you ever been in that place? I most certainly have. So sometimes what honors the Lord 
is not always what conventional wisdom might tell us. And so we need to be careful that we're listening to God's wisdom and not the wisdom of this world. And that really comes to the last point, which is to pray for wisdom and understanding. To pray for wisdom and understanding. It seems like Solomon could have asked for many things, or at least God expected him to. Right? God had this list of things ready where he's like, you didn't ask for this, and you didn't ask for that, and you didn't ask for this. Maybe that's the stuff that all of the pagan kings all around him always were praying for to their false gods. Who knows? Maybe he, he had a tally up there in heaven of all of those empty prayers to empty statues. And that's what they wanted. But Solomon wanted something different. He wanted understanding. And God wants us to have wisdom as well. Wisdom is precious. In fact, the Bible says that if you have to choose between rubies and sapphires, between valuable gems or wisdom, you choose wisdom. You have to choose between understanding or any of the riches of this world, you choose understanding. And you say, why would I do that? Why would I do that? Let's go back to taking the test for a second. Imagine that you are set down to take a test, and it's a hard one. And the paper is put down in front of you, and you've got your number two pencil. Do they still do the fill in the bubble thing in school? Do they still have scantrons? Or is that another thing with like the rotary telephone? Okay. I see some of you looking at me blankly. I'm not sure. But you, you have to fill in. You've got all your stuff, and then the teacher walks by your desk and sets down the answer key with the test. And the vast majority of the answers are already on the answer key for you. And you're like, is this okay? This is like cheating. You, you mean, here are the problems that I have to solve, and here are the answers for those. That's what it's like to have wisdom from God. It's like God has given you the answer key. How would you like to know the answers that you need for the problems in your marriage? How would you like to know the answers that you need for the problems in your workplace? Or in your friendships? Or in other relationships? How would you like to know the answers that you need for, for dating and finding the person that God has for you in this world? Or what career that you should go into? Or how do I handle this problem? H how would you like to have the answers for those things? I would love to have the answers for those things. God calls it, instead of an answer key, he calls it a wise and understanding heart. That's what it's like to have a heart that's receptive to God's wisdom. It's like having the answer key to life. It's amazing to find out that the creator of the universe who made you, and you are made in his image, also gave you all of the answers, and that the answers work. The answers actually work. If you do it God's way, it works. I know it sounds crazy. He doesn't have an Instagram post with all sorts of fire emojis underneath it. But he has given us the living word of God that abides forever. And so when you and I pray for things, it's not wrong to pray for the physical things that we need. Jesus, in the model prayer, taught us that, you know, give us this day our daily bread, right? We need these things. But let us not get so focused on the good things that we get from God, that we don't pray to become the good thing that God wants us to be, right? Uh, it says that it's better to have wisdom and understanding than to be rich, a house filled with riches. And the world today would say, give me the riches, I don't need the wisdom. But then we also said we don't feel like we're surrounded in a world of discernment, do we? But God's people, if there was ever a time when by faith you asked the Lord Jesus to forgive your sins and be your Savior. And really, that's where wisdom starts. If you want to know where wisdom and knowledge begin, it's the fear of the Lord. You say, I'm supposed to be afraid of God? We're supposed to respect and revere him. Not the kind of respect or the kind of fear where you run and hide from him, but where you so value his opinion and you so appreciate him that you're not going to walk foolishly or callously or flippantly around him. You're going to behave in a certain way to demonstrate your love and your value and your appreciation for him. That's what it means to fear the Lord. And if you have never come to Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, that's where wisdom starts. That's where that relationship begins. You see, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You say, well, what is sin? I haven't done anything that bad. Well, anytime God says, don't do this bad thing, and we do it anyway, we've sinned. And God says, do these good things over here. And we're like, I don't have time for that. I'm not doing that. That is sin. You say, well, I've never done anything that bad. And I, friend, I thought the same way 
if that's what's going through your head. But have you ever lied? I have. Have you ever stolen anything, no matter how small it is? I have. Have you ever fixated on something you didn't have but you wanted? Have you ever been so angry in your heart that if you could have gotten away with it, you would have destroyed somebody's life? Have you ever lusted or coveted? Have you ever put anything ahead of God in your life? If you have, then you, like me, are a sinner. And our sin separates us from God. God is so holy, he can't even look on sin. And so you and I, if we are separated from God because of our sin in this life, when this life is over, we'll be separated from God because of our sin in the world to come. Which means a very real and a very terrible place referred to as hell in the Bible. It was prepared for the devil and his angels, and it's absolutely horrible. It's not a party with your friends. It's not a place with uh, sort of second best and you'll go to for a little while and eventually you'll graduate out of it. It is the blackness of darkness forever. It is burning. It is the gnashing of teeth where the worm dieth not. It is the worst thing that you and I, and we can't even truly comprehend how terrible it is. And though we deserve to go there, God went to great lengths to make sure we didn't end up there. And that's why he gave his son, his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he might pay the debt, the penalty, the punishment that you and I deserve. See, that's why the Lord Jesus came. By the way, he didn't just come to give you wisdom, though that's a good thing. He didn't just come so you can have an understanding heart and you can have the answers to life. He came to deal with your chief problem, which is not a lack of wisdom. It is your chief problem, like every man, woman, boy, and girl who's ever been born into this world. Your chief problem is my chief problem, and that's my sin. And God gave his son so that you and I might have a way back to God. A great price needed to be paid to deal with sin. You see, God is just. And a just God doesn't take the bad things that someone does and just wink at him and be like, ah, it's okay, go on in. You're fine. That's not a just God. That's not a just God. A just God says punishment must be dealt out for sin. But as though we were in the courtroom of heaven and eternity passed, and God said mankind will sin and they'll be judged for it. Christ stood up, for, metaphorically speaking, and said, I'll suffer for them. I'll pay the price so that they can have a way out. That's why it meant that Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. And if you call on the Lord Jesus to forgive your sins and be your Savior this morning, you can have heaven, eternal life. You can, you can not go to the hell that you deserve, and you can have a home in heaven that can never be taken from you, that you and I don't deserve, that's filled with such riches and wonderful things that we can't even wrap our minds around all that's there. That's where it all begins, is coming to Christ simply by faith. You say, do I have to join this church? No. Do I have to get baptized? No. Do I have to do a bunch of good deeds? No. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That if you, by faith, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, asking the Lord Jesus to forgive your sins, you will be saved. And so Solomon's prayer points us to living a life of wisdom. But wisdom, true wisdom, only comes from the Lord. And you and I can have it if we ask for it. It says in James chapter 1, in verse number 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. You say, liberally? I don't know if I, I want that. Well, think generously. Think generously. It's meaning that God loves to give wisdom. And he upbraideth not. He doesn't get mad when we come and ask for it. He's delighted that we come and ask for it. But it all begins with our relationship with Christ. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child, and I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes for just a moment? In our church, we have what we call a time of invitation, where we invite you to act on whatever it is that God has spoken to you about. Perhaps you're here this morning and, and you're not a bad person, but you're also not really a church person. You're, you're, not, you're not familiar with 
the things I've been speaking about with Christ and the idea of, of hell sounds old-fashioned, but also a little bit terrifying at the same time. And you wonder to yourself, I'm not sure if this is true, but I want to know if it's true. You say, I'm not sure if I'm a sinner, but I certainly don't want to go to hell for it. And God is dealing with me about whether or not I, I have heaven as my home and whether or not I, I'm truly a child of God. With every head bowed and every eye closed and, and no one looking around, please. I just want to pray for you. If that's you, if you're feeling like I'm not sure that I'm ready to die, I'm not sure that heaven's my home, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm saved. Just between you and me and God, because I want to pray for you, would you slip your hand up? I won't embarrass you. I won't call you out. I won't come to you before or after the, the service. I just want to pray for you. Is there anybody like that today? And say, that's me. Would you mind just slipping your hand up and putting it right back down, saying, that's me. Pray for me, Pastor. Anybody at all this morning? Believer, if you know the Lord, how are you making your decisions? Have you been caught in the busyness of life and you're just being swept along, bumping along every rock that happens to be in that river, muddling through? I've been there. I'm there still on some days. Maybe you say, I need to start making better decisions. I need to start asking, what would honor the Lord? If that's you this morning and you're praying, Lord, help me, help me to make my decisions with you in mind, would you just slip your hand up and put it right back down and say, Lord, that's me. I want to make decisions with you in mind. Amen. God sees your hands. Amen. Me too. I'm right there with you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Maybe you've been struggling because you felt this pressure to have all the answers, to know exactly what to do in every situation, and, and it's just weighing you down, and you need freedom from that to know that it's okay to ask the Lord, and he really will give you wisdom, and he will give you discernment, and it all doesn't have to be on your shoulders, and you need that rest. Or did anybody with an uplifted hand say, that's me. God's dealing with me about not having to know all the answers and to rest in him. Would you mind just slipping your hand up? I want to pray for you. Amen. The Lord sees. He does. In just a moment, we'll stand and sing. I'll be down here at the head of this aisle. And if you've never trusted Christ as Savior, but you want to this morning, you can just slip out of your seat and walk down the aisle and come and speak to me. And someone will take you aside privately. A gentleman with a gentleman, a lady with a lady, and show you from God's word how you can know for sure that you're saved and that your sins are forgiven. But maybe you want to come and cast your burdens upon the Lord and pray, either right there in your seat or here at this place of prayer up front. Maybe you want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism or you want to put your life and influence in this church as a member. Whatever it is that God is speaking to you about, let's say yes to him this morning. Father, we do ask that you would work in our hearts, that we might just not have another sermon and more knowledge of you or of Solomon, but that we might be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing.
Let's pray together. Father, may you do an abiding work in our hearts. May there be fruit that abounds, fruit that remains from the things that your Spirit has showed us today. Help us to be people who ask for wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Well, a few announcements as we wrap our service up this morning. First off, at 5 p.m. this evening, there is ensemble practice. So if you're part of the ensemble, please plan on being here for that. There's also a... Uh, a Forge Men's Ministry planning meeting. If you're on the, that planning team, that's at 515 tonight. And that's in preparation for our steak fry this coming Saturday at uh, 5 p.m. here at the church. That is bring your own steak and everything else will be provided. And uh, there is, we're trying to have a cornhole tournament for those that are interested. So there is a sign up sheet if you'd like to participate in that. You need a partner, so find a partner and there will be prizes. Assuming we get enough interest in that Otherwise, there'll just be some cornhole boards out there for uh, little pickup games while the steaks are being grilled, and there'll be some great time of testimony and, and sharing as well. So uh, please plan on joining us uh, for that event. You don't have to sign up for it other than the tournament if you're going to play in that tournament. The ladies' ministry is also this Friday at 6 p.m. at the Harbaugh's house, and there's still a sign-up sheet in the involvement board for that. So uh, if you're planning on coming to that, please let them know. So they can give you the proper address and directions and uh, anything that uh, is needed for that wonderful event as well. North Homestead Homecoming Days are quickly approaching. That's the 24th of August through the 27th. That's a Thursday through Sunday. And for the last 10 years, this is our 10th year of doing this, we set up a booth. And uh, we'll do, as we've done in the past, we've got free water, free freeze pops, a ginormous will that, that Brother Ed built years ago that it becomes a magnet for anyone there. They see it, and the kids spin it, and they get a free prize, and some spin it dozens of times, and we give them a prize almost every time because we have a bunch of prizes. But this coming week, I will put a sign-up sheet for that to work in the booth, and so we usually have two- to three-hour shifts, and so we, we need workers on Thursday evening and Friday evening all day, Saturday noon to close, which is around 10 p.m., I believe, and then Sunday from noon to about 4 and it's just a great way to meet our community, to see how North Homestead has changed over the years, and to uh, talk with people and uh, show forth and share the love of Christ with them. So uh, please help us with that. Uh, the more workers, the better. If it's only a few, it becomes very challenging to uh, have that booth staff, so uh, uh, please help us with that. And then next Sunday, after the morning service, a brief usher greeter meeting. If you're part of that ministry, uh, please plan on attending that. And I'll announce that again next Sunday, but again, just uh, to get that on your radar there. Uh, a few prayer requests. Um, continue to pray for Linda Basinger as she recovers from surgery. She's a couple weeks out from her hip surgery now, and just uh, pray that that would continue to get stronger. Uh, pray for our, uh, Arlo Johannes, that's uh, Laurel's brother, who had a stroke a couple of weeks ago. Pray for his continued recovery and, and progress there. Pray for Devin Jarvis, who is, remains in Mexico receiving cancer treatments, and I pray for her and her husband as they are down there. This is week two or week three? She'll be home this coming Friday. And so she's still in the midst of that. Pray that the, those would be successful and that they uh, safety and travel as they come home on Friday. And then she'll be home for a while before she goes back for another series of treatments, uh, three-week uh, treatments there. So pray for Devin, her husband, uh, her children, and through that. And then uh, pray for Chris and her family. Uh, her mom, as many of you know, went home to be with the Lord this past Thursday night. And many of you have known Pat. She's been here many times. They live in Indiana. And um, uh, absent from the body to be present with the Lord, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And what a glorious time we had as 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 much grief as well experienced, but to know that as uh, Pat breathed her breath, last breath here on earth on Thursday evening, that uh, she was immediately in the presence of her Savior. And so Chris and her brothers and sibling, or spouses and then her dad, and we were all there together with her. And so we head back to Indiana this later this coming week and funeral event, uh, viewing on Friday, funeral on Saturday, it will be Certainly a challenging time as people from all over the, the, the country are working on getting their way to Angola, Indiana for the funeral. So pray for uh, Chris and, and her dad especially and um, that uh, he would 
pour out grace as he always does and comfort for those that are grieving but uh boy, what hope there is and what joy there is in the midst of, of heartache knowing that uh it's goodbye for now but uh we'll see you again soon and uh Along those lines, that was Pat, Pat Eiler, uh, another good friend of mine, Pat Payne, pastor's wife, pastored for 35 plus years in Shingle House, Pennsylvania, and uh, probably a lot similar to my mother-in-law's age, graduated to heaven again this past week. And uh, Roger was here with Pat years ago, sharing in one of our services. So uh, pray for brother Roger Payne as he mourns the loss of his dear wife, Pat, as well. All right, Pastor, anything else that uh, prayer requests that maybe I missed in the fog of things? Yes, so uh, on Friday evening from 5 to 8 p.m. in Angola, Indiana, at Fairview Missionary Church, is a church that her parents were members of. And then on Saturday from 9 to 11, there will be another viewing there at the church. The funeral service will be at 11 a.m. at Fairview Missionary Church, Angola, Indiana. And then there'll be a, a brief uh, luncheon after that, and then the burial will be in Rockford, Ohio, which is about 75 miles south of there. And um, just, again, pray for all involved, all the travel involved. Uh, um, so, yeah, everyone's certainly welcome. I know it's three hours away from Cleveland. It's a long <laughs> journey there, but uh, certainly do appreciate your prayers for all of those that uh, are traveling in for that. All right, if you're able, I invite you to stand. Uh, Gloria and Michaela, you guys really ministered. Thank you. Kyle, would you leave some of closing prayer? Nothing between like worldly pleasure, habits of life, though harmless they seem, must not my heart from him ever sever. He is my all, there's nothing between. Have a good evening.